who are a few of the most despicable criminals around. Let's get right to it, starting with number five, the Georgian lawmaker. Felicia Franklin, a former Georgia lawmaker, faced a major setback when her night out at a sports bar turned into a public spectacle, leading to her removal from her vice chair position on the board of commissioners. Caught on camera in a drunken stupor, Franklin's claim of having her cocktail spiked with an unknown substance clashed with the evidence uncovered by the police. The saga began when Franklin, also eyeing the county chairman position, got in some trouble after an altercation outside the 404 Sports Bar and Grill in Morrow, Georgia. Supposedly incapacitated by illegal substances, Franklin's version of events painted a picture of vulnerability and foul play. However, Sergeant Scott Stewart from the Morrow Police Department contradicted her claims, explaining that there was no evidence to support her claim of having something slipped into her drink without her knowledge. Security footage showed Franklin entering the bar alone and indulging in multiple drinks, including cocktails with high alcohol content. By the time police arrived, she was sprawled on the ground, unconscious. Despite her disoriented state, Franklin managed to shout at the medics and officers attending to her, even striking an EMT while she was in the ambulance. As the dust settled, further investigations revealed discrepancies in Franklin's account. Receipts and video evidence contradicted her claims of only consuming a few drinks, exposing a night of heavy drinking. Moreover, a toxicology report detected compounds from that, let's just call it sticky icky icky in her system. Amidst the fallout, Franklin faced the consequences of her actions. The Clayton County Board of Commissioners, citing behavior unbecoming of her position, unanimously voted to remove her as vice chair. Despite her protests and claims of political sabotage, the decision remained unaltered, leaving Franklin's political future uncertain. Franklin attempted to salvage her reputation and political ambitions through social media, but her efforts were futile. The controversy surrounding her behavior outside the sports bar had tarnished her image irreparably. With the case closed by the police and no charges pressed by the EMTs, Franklin was left to pick up the pieces and contemplate her next steps in the aftermath of the incident. And seriously, the last thing we all need is yet another hypocrite telling us about rules that don't apply to them. No thank you and good day. Number four, the pink haired mugger. A 24 year old unnamed woman from New York found herself pinned against an apartment building by a female mugger in broad daylight. The mugger had pink hair and she had a male accomplice as well who helped to restrain the poor lady. In a desperate attempt to escape, the victim sought refuge in a nearby building, but the assailants persisted, attempting to grab her belongings, including her phone. Thankfully, an unnamed doorman witnessed the mugging and intervened, preventing further harm to the woman. Despite his efforts, one of the muggers falsely accused the victim of theft momentarily distracting the doorman, allowing the perpetrators to snatch the victim's phone before fleeing the scene. Surveillance footage captured the assailants, providing clear descriptions to the NYPD. The female suspect was described as having pink hair, wearing a black bubble jacket and a gray jogging suit with white sneakers, and sporting a fanny pack or purse around her waist. Her male accomplice was described as having a medium build and a mustache, wearing a two-tone hoodie and blue jeans. The incident is just another on a long list as an example of the persistent challenge of robbery in New York City, which saw a 5.4% increase in January of 2024 compared to the previous year. Despite declines in other types of crimes, the city continues to grapple with the issue of robbery. It would seem that wearing something as attention-getting as a bright pink wig wouldn't be the smartest thing to wear when someone's out doing a crime. Number three, the worst gas station. Texas attorney Maxie Schur is offering a hefty $10,000 reward after her son got caught up in an Oakland gas station ordeal. He was ambushed by a gang of armed robbers while gassing up his car near Oakland International Airport. Schur's son, fresh from celebrating his 21st birthday in Sonoma and Napa, places known for their wines, 21-year-olds are going to wineries to celebrate these days? Well, anyway, he and his friends made a pit stop at a 76 gas station around 2 p.m. Little did they know, trouble was a-brewing. 
According to Schur, it's become all too common for incidents like these to go down, especially with rental vehicles, earning Oakland a not-so-flattering reputation, as if it didn't already have one. Criminals in the area operate in organized crews, targeting airport-bound or returning travelers with ruthless efficiency. The gas station where the incident unfolded isn't the only hotspot. Nearby spots, such as a Shell station and an In-N-Out Burger parking lot, also see their fair share of crime. And it's not just petty theft we're talking about either. These crooks operate with a purpose, targeting rental cars and smashing windows or popping trunks to snatch valuables and luggage in the blink of an eye. The 50% increase in car-related crimes occurring in less than a year hasn't gone unnoticed, with the Shell gas station earning the dubious title of America's Most Dangerous Gas Station. Online reviews paint a dark picture as well, with tales of bold thefts in broad daylight and warning to avoid these places. Despite increased police patrols, the situation doesn't seem to be improving, with car thefts skyrocketing and repeat offenders slipping through the cracks. Oakland's mayor, Shang Tao, also refuses to take any blame, pointing to rising crime trends that began before her tenure. Officers on the ground feel like the solution is pretty straightforward. Ditch the failed social experiments that are ruining Northern California and focus on strategies that actually work. Do you live in the Bay Area? How are things going? Tell us in the comments below. Number two, faking dementia. Ethel McGill dubbed Britain's worst benefits cheat, managed to scam 750,000 pounds by hiding her father's passing and feigning dementia. Sentenced to five years and eight months in July of 2019, she was also slapped with an extra eight months for failing to pay back 200,500 pounds of her ill-gotten gains. The amateur actress from Cheshire concealed her father's passing for 12 years to claim his war pension and benefits. She she even went as far as having a friend pretend to be him under a blanket at her home. Her deceptive acts spanned over two decades, with McGill also pretending to have dementia and mobility issues. Even after she was caught on film moving without assistance and driving despite claiming to need a wheelchair, McGill's theatrics continued during her court appearance. She showed up in a wheelchair with incontinence pads to hide her face from photographers. It was uh, very dignified. In court, McGill admitted to her fraudulent activities, which the Crown Prosecution Service described as one of the largest cases of benefit fraud by a single person. Despite her defense's claims of a modest lifestyle, McGill's deceitful schemes raked in far more than the average person's income. The judge lambasted McGill for sullying her father's name and criticized the authorities for failing to detect the fraud. McGill's six-year and six-month sentence included an additional term for not paying the confiscation order. In a letter to the prisoner's newspaper, McGill boasted about her great prison experience, claiming it felt like living in a little village. She painted a rosy picture of life behind bars, with the amenities and care provided despite her criminal activities. Which is not what you want to hear from someone incarcerated. We're not vengeful, but if that's her attitude, then she's a little too comfortable, right? It's like when a kid is in trouble and gets spanked, and in an act of defiance, pretends like it doesn't hurt or laughs. We did that once. It didn't go well for us. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned for our past release to find out how she pretended to be a successful business guru. Number one, squatters rights. In New York City, Susanna and Joseph Landa's dream of retiring in a $2 million home with their disabled son has turned into a nightmare as they battle squatter Brett Flores, who claims he had a deal with the previous owner. The Landas bought the Queen's property but couldn't move in yet, thanks to Flores. Flores worked as a caretaker for the previous owner until his passing, roughly seven months before the Landas bought the house. Now, he insists, he has a license to stay put. Despite giving him a 10-day notice to vacate, the Landas couldn't get him out. Under New York squatter's rights, it's illegal to evict an occupant who's lawfully stayed for over 30 days, complicating matters further. Even though Flores isn't a tenant and has no lease, the police couldn't remove him. Because somehow, that was deemed lawful, we guess. Seriously, squatters' rights make no sense. And to make things worse, Flores had been subletting rooms in the property. He has listed the Prince Room for $50 a night online, raking in cash while the Landas foot the bills, including hefty heating costs due to open windows. Which also doesn't make sense. If Flores said he was supposed to be there, shouldn't he be paying the heating costs? The couple's attempts to resolve the issue through civil court have been 
stymied by Flores' tactics, including showing up without an attorney and filing for bankruptcy, which grants him temporary refuge under New York City law. Joseph Landa expressed frustration with the legal system, feeling forgotten and powerless. Despite their efforts, the Landas must wait until April for a landlord-tenant court hearing in hopes of finally evicting Flores and reclaiming their home. Squatters suck, and squatters taking advantage of loopholes suck even more. Like most laws, the idea of squatters' rights came from good intentions. One of the main reasons they exist is to discourage people from buying property and then abandoning it or just letting it go to ruin. Another reason is to prevent some random person with a deed dated from, say, 200 years ago showing up and saying the property is theirs. The current resident and supposed homeowner who has lived there for over 20 years wouldn't be just thrown out because of squatters' rights. It gives them a chance to settle the dispute. Of course, the actual laws are more nuanced, but that's the meat and potatoes of it. With all the loopholes in NYC, though, it seems like people can just break into a place and claim it in a short period of time. Who are some of the most despicable scammers you'd never want to meet? Let's start with... Number six, another fake guru. Miriam Mbula scammed tons of people through a decade-long criminal career. But instead of owning up to her criminal past and present, she painted herself as a victim of circumstances. She was so successful in doing this that she was once invited to a TV show to speak about her life and inspire other women. On the show, Mbula claimed that her involvement in crime was due to being in a bad relationship and running with the wrong group. She also said that she went to prison and was forced to have her child while she was in the slammer. But her stories are only shades of the truth, not the truth in full color. Like some 80s action hero, Miriam found herself in Spanish prison. Well, a Spanish prison, like a prison in Spain, not a prison for Spaniards, where she befriended the mother of a woman named Ellie. Miriam took care of the woman and became very useful as a translator. Miriam claimed that she'd be able to get the woman a bail hearing, but to do this, she'd need some personal information. The information included things like her children's names, their ages, and any other detail the woman could produce. Miriam claimed all of this was just to get the right bail hearing. Most bail judges, especially Spanish bail judges, like hearing personal details about kids they've never met. It uh, softens their hearts. So it makes sense that Miriam would need to know about her kids and grandkids for a bail hearing. Seriously, wasn't the woman like, why are you asking me about my kids for this? A while later, the woman's daughter, Ellie, got a call from someone named Charlene claiming to be an embassy official. Charlene claimed that her mother would be granted a bail hearing for a fee of 10,000 pounds. The official knew everything there was to know about her, so Ellie paid the money. The official called again and this time asked for 5,600 pounds more. Again, Ellie gave them money. However, Ellie noticed something was wrong when a text from Charlene had the Apple ID Miriam Dynasty. Ellie asked who Miriam Dynasty was and Charlene stopped replying. Ellie knew she'd been scammed. The incident was so financially catastrophic that Ellie and her family, including a child with Down syndrome, were evicted as a result. A year after that incident, Miriam continued her schemes by meeting another woman and convincing her that she worked for Nike. Miriam then convinced the woman that she could make her daughter the face of the sportswear brand. Every parent thinks their kid's the best looking, so it's reasonable that the woman bought it. So the woman paid 11,400 pounds for an opportunity that never existed. Miriam, adding insult to injury, scammed the woman again by selling her luxury items that were never delivered. The victim paid 18,214 pounds for dresses she never got because Miriam never had them either. And still, Miriam was able to use her status as a single mother to sell another sob story. When she came on TV to talk about her experiences, Miriam said that what she went through inspired her to create Mentor Matcher. Mentor Matcher was a program that matched disadvantaged young women with mentors who would guide them to the right path. Women who would like to learn from the Mentor Matcher program were supposed to pay a ticket fee of $200 just to listen to Miriam speak. So, a lot like college. Am I right? However, Miriam's claims that she was only a victim of circumstances didn't hold up to scrutiny. Because she was arrested and put in prison, Miriam had committed a slew of credit card fraud. 
rods. At the time this video drops, she had built an incredible criminal career riddled with 13 convictions for 34 offenses. This includes 27 charges for fraud and dishonesty, and she has been jailed in the UK, Belgium, and Spain. Miriam has become so infamous that she now has an informal group of victims going after her. One of her victims, Tamara Gao, created a Twitter account and started asking for people who had been scammed by Miriam to step forward, and they did. One of the women who came forward was Miriam's college friend, Chimina. Chimina said that Miriam was always the friendly type in college, and a while after graduation, they got in contact through Facebook. Very soon, Miriam became a close friend, and Chimina started telling her about the trouble she had. One day, Chimina made the mistake telling her about her grandmother, who just had a few months to live. Chimina and her mother were flying back to Jamaica to see her and were in the process of getting tickets. Miriam told her that she could get discounted tickets for her through her company and that Chimina should send over the ticket money to purchase the tickets at a discount. Unfortunately, Chimina trusted her friend and sent the money. Yep, it turned out to be a scam because Miriam didn't send any tickets over and stopped picking up Chimina's calls. It's hard to believe Miriam could even find the time to scam an old college friend who's trying to visit a terminally ill relative. What with all the clubbing of baby seals she's probably been doing. But Miriam didn't just scam in prison and outside. She also took her trade to church. After leaving prison, she joined SPAC Nation Church, a congregation based in South London, where she became senior pastor. This is a church we've covered in the past. At the church, she began relating with young churchgoers and made her home a safe space for them. But before long, she began asking her congregation for money. According to one of her victims, Sarah, Miriam's entire shtick was to find young people with good credit ratings and get them to borrow money to loan her. This created a situation where young people around her suffered with repaying the loans while Miriam hardly bothered about them. Somehow, Miriam has yet to be arrested for any of these crimes. She's still at large and an investigation into her conduct's ongoing. And Ellie, the evicted woman with the Down Syndrome's kid? Seriously, who evicts a family like hers? I don't care that you were just scammed and your child has special needs. Get out on the street where you belong. They were probably better off without a landlord like that anyway. Number five, serial squatting. Heather Ann Schwab has been sentenced to prison for repeated housing scams that left homeowners in debt. The prolific scammer and her husband, Mr. Heather Ann Schwab, have been evicted from their rented homes more than 20 times. The modus operandi of the couple's fraud is exactly what you'd expect it to be. They would use phony names to escape background checks while filing paperwork to move into their new homes. Then the Schwabs would refuse to pay rent, forcing the homeowners to go through the tedious process of evicting them legally. Once they were evicted, the couple would go and start the scam with another home. According to one former landlord, Heather and her husband always gave excuses when asking about their payments. It was usually something or the other. When they eventually got evicted, which was five months after moving in, the landlord discovered that they had trashed the entire house. The couple became so notorious for their scamming that they eventually had to switch states and start all over. And once they moved, they began their fraud once more. The Schwabs were eventually arrested and made to face the law. Heather was sentenced to six years in prison and her husband will also be sentence in the future. The good thing is that they won't need to pay rent in prison. It's free. And while the scam makes sense on paper, yeah, just move in and wait until you're forced out four to five months later. Sure, free rent, but who wants to move that much? And they'd been evicted over 20 times. We pay high rent just so we don't have to move once every five years. Those two are crazy. Number four, magical scammers. A couple of fake magicians, as opposed to actual magicians such as Chris Angel. Is that guy still around? Anyway, they fleeced an unsuspecting man of 1,700 pounds after performing a magic trick. Their victim was cognitively impaired, so he was an easy target for the fake Chris Angels to finally fool someone and make money. The first of the tricksters approached the man and told him that he had good fortune. Afterwards, the man performed a magic trick for him and asked for payment for the trick. The second magician then approached the victim and performed the same trick, illusion, and then demanded he withdraw cash from the ATM for payment. In total, the victim withdrew 1,700 pounds to pay the two fraudsters. The scammers are still on the run, and the police are looking for information that could lead to their arrest. And performing the same trick twice in a row? That has to be against some rule somewhere in the Magic Castle. And for our money, David Blaine's the closest to Houdini we're ever going to get, and is far superior to Chris Angel. Shout out in the comments if you agree. Number three, the good old faking an illness scam. Wendy Jane Lentini scammed the government thousands 
thousands of dollars after claiming to have multiple sclerosis. The funny thing about this is that Lentini is currently serving a jail term for insurance fraud, so she isn't new to this at all. Lentini had been sentenced to a five-year jail term back in 2018 when she was found guilty of scamming the Commonwealth Bank's common share. To commit the Commonwealth Bank fraud, Lentini claimed she had multiple sclerosis. This allowed her to receive a massive payout from the bank. When quizzed about the crime, she claimed that she committed it because her husband was physically abusing her and she was suffering from battered wife syndrome. She was only discovered after her husband sent a letter to law enforcement a decade after the crime was committed. The police discovered that around that period, Jane also committed disability check fraud on the basis of a multiple sclerosis diagnosis that she never had. To commit the fraud, she enlisted the help of a woman who actually had the disease and used her paperwork to file for the disability checks. When the scam was discovered, prosecutors decided to ask for extra time to be added to Jane's current sentence. Jane's attorney, on the other hand, claimed that his client had already served time and was sorry for offending. The judge, hearing her case, said that Jane might be sorry, but she never came clean about her crime. In fairness, though, why would she? Did the judge expect her to randomly come forward while she was already serving her sentence for a similar crime? Lantini was still awaiting sentencing at the time of this video. Number two, choose Ponzi. Derek Chu was accused of running a Ponzi scheme and defrauding people of over $39 million. Chu used several companies to raise millions of dollars from unsuspecting victims. The victims were told that their money would be used for investments that would guarantee them fantastic returns. Chu said that their money would go into purchasing and reselling basketball tickets. They were also told that they would invest in luxury suites around the country, but none of that was ever done. Chu simply took the money he was given and spent it on luxury cars, expensive jewelry, and travel. For the luxury suit scam, Chu would take his victims to the Chase Center in San Francisco. Then he would tell them they would earn a 50% interest if they invested in a suite for $440,000. Instead of purchasing the suite, he used the new money to pay previous investors just like a regular Ponzi scheme. Derek Chu used a part of the largesse from his fraud to indulge in his love for collecting luxury cars. He bought 12 expensive Lexuses and some Porsches according to a complaint against him. He also bought a house from the proceeds of his fraudulent business. The house was in an affluent area, and he made sure to use it to convince more unsuspecting people to lend him money. One of the victims who believed in him was a man named Jonathan Mayedes. Mayedes believed that Chu was a successful businessman as a result of his lavish spending and decided to loan him money through promissory notes. In total, Mayedes loaned Chu over $750,000. Most of the money is yet to be returned. The insane thing about this entire gig is that it isn't the first time Chu would be accused of fraudulent behavior. In fact, he had previously been caught up in a fraud case with his father, Felix Chu. Felix was accused of running an elaborate scam that targeted elderly investors and swindled them out of their life savings. According to the complaint, Felix and his son, Derek, issued promissory notes to their victims and paid out the interest on the investments for a while before stopping. Derek has now been arrested and charged with wire fraud and money laundering. He's been ordered to pay back Mayedes what's owed and currently faces 20 years in prison if convicted of wire fraud. He also faces up to 10 years in prison for money laundering. Number one, the church going Ponzi. Efren Taylor defrauded members of several churches of over $14 million by promising them extraordinary returns through ethical investments. The basics of the scam were simple. Taylor sold an image of a young Christian black man who made money through smart and ethical investments. Soon, Taylor started touring churches and speaking to congregations about ethical investment practices. In his messages to congregations, he made sure to invoke Jesus, quote, Bible passages and generally sell a fantastic and overblown image of himself in his business. For example, Taylor said he made his first million and founded two tech companies before leaving high school. He called himself the youngest black millionaire and CEO in the country. When asked about his net worth, he claimed that it was $20 million on a bad day. But his fraud didn't kick off till he went on what he called the wealth tour. This tour was a tour of popular churches where he was invited to speak about wealth, creation, and socially conscious investment opportunities. Taylor was invited to these churches to speak about how to make money ethically, but he instead went there to two his horn and convinced members of the church to give him their money to invest. On the tour, he told members of the congregation to fire their brokers because they weren't investing well ethically and were inefficient. He said that he had a low risk and high reward model that guaranteed steady returns through socially conscious investment vehicles. Of course, these were all lies. The churchgoers who listened to Taylor were lulled into believing him because he seemed like a good Christian. Taylor preached the gospel, was rich, and had the approval of their pastors to speak to them. These Christians also believed that ostentatious living in pre 
preachers of the word is a sign of God's grace, not a red flag that they should run from. So obviously, everything checked out. They must have forgotten Jesus' opinions on personal wealth. When he started speaking with individuals who wanted to invest their savings with him, Taylor said he could guarantee a 20% return on investments. He also told them that they could invest in sweepstakes machines that guaranteed a 300% return on investments. He claimed that 20% of the returns will be given to charity as well. But that was all a lie. The machines and investment vehicles he spoke about literally did not exist. Instead of using investor funds as they wanted, Taylor used the money to fund his wife's music career, pay rent, settle business expenses, and in a few cases, pay previous investors. It was a proper Ponzi scheme. One of his biggest victims was Gary and Anita Dorio, a couple who attended Lakewood Church, owned by the popular evangelist Joel Austin. When Taylor went to the Lakewood Church, he was allowed to speak about finances to a small group. But before he was introduced, a staff member reminded the group that Taylor wasn't endorsed by the church. Unfortunately, the Dorios believed Taylor's pitch, and they turned over $1.2 million to him to invest. Soon, things began to fall apart for the enterprising scammer. He ran out of money to pay investors, and they began banging on his office doors. When Taylor noticed that things were disintegrating, he fled his office and disabled his website so none of his victims could reach him. He essentially had to go into hiding. When the Dorios learned that they had been scammed, they went back to the church and were told that they should never have invested with him, like they didn't already know that. The same message was given to other members of other churches who told their pastors about how Taylor scammed them as well. There was no help from the churches, and the victims had to sit with the reality that they had lost their money for life. Taylor could run, but he was very bad at hiding. After about a year, he and his wife would be tracked down to their hiding spot. His wife had given up on her music and now rented a massage room at a massage parlor called Panacea Massage. The workers at the parlor became suspicious of Mrs. Taylor, who called herself Liz Taylor, when they overheard conversations between her and her husband being concerned about cameras in the shop. There was also constant discussion between the pair about the fortune they'd lost. So the co-workers googled her and discovered that her husband was a huge fraud and on the run from the police. They eventually got in contact with one of those gotcha news shows called The Lookout, who then later told the police. In the end, Efren Taylor was arrested and was made to face the law. He was sentenced to 19 years in prison and was ordered to pay restitution of about $15 million. When are these guys going to learn? Ponzi's never work. Don't do them. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section what you'd rather do. Only eat spicy food for the rest of your life or only eat bland food with no seasoning.